Good morning, everybody. Today we will continue with chapter 22 and we will learn the details of Gauss law. So what we have this in this chapter, we will learn how to determine the amount of charge within a closed surface. Let's consider that here we have a positive charge and here we have a closed surface. OK, and what about the total charge within this enclosed surface? So we will learn within this chapter how to calculate this charge by examining the electric field on the surface, and we will get a relation between charge and electric field in closed surfaces, and we will learn electric flux, and we will discuss how to calculate electric flux and what is the relation between electric flux and electric field and also electric charge. And we will finish the first part of the lecture with the Gauss law. It is very useful to calculate the electric field due to a symmetric charge distribution. Actually, this chapter will be more or less about this equation, Gauss law. OK, so within whole chapter, in chapter 22, we will talk about this equation. We will use this equation. Here you see electric flux. Here you see electric field. And this is the A area of a closed surface. And then this is the total charge within the closed surface. So we will deal with this formula within this chapter. And it is very easy to understand and uh, we will calculate the electric field due to different shapes of metals and also charges in different objects. OK, so by using this formula, we will able to calculate electric field. Remember the discussion during the last lecture by using the Clomb's law, we calculated electric field by using this formula, right? So we have a charge, a source, and then at a distance far from the source, what is the electric field? We have calculated this one during the last lecture by using the Clomb's law, right? And during this lecture, what you see here, here we have electric field and here we have charge, okay? So the same relation, but much simpler formulation and generally very useful to calculate the electric fields of different objects with the different charges. And finally, within this chapter, we will discuss where the charge is located on a charge conductor. So we will discuss the special cases for the conductors. OK, so this is the summary of the chapter 22. So here you see a child. She acquires an electric charge by touching the charged metal shell here on the right side and her hairs are charged, okay? And the charged hairs repel and stand out because here we have, let's say, positive charge and then all charges transferred to the hairs of the child. And then, so same charges repel each other and then you see this kind of picture, okay? But now we have a question. What would happen if the child stood inside a large charged metal shell? Here, this child touches on this metal shell, but what happens if we use a huge metal shell and put this child into this charged metal shell? OK, so within this lecture, we will answer this question and we will use the symmetry properties to calculate the electric field. It will help us a lot to calculate the electric field or charge of the charge of the different shapes. OK, so it, it is very useful phenomena in physics, so we will use symmetry principles. Here you see a box, OK? And just consider that we have a 
charge here within this box. And then we would like to calculate electric field on this surface, on this surface, on this surface, or electric field here at this point, far from the box, for example. Here I have a charge, positive charge or negative charge, and I would like to calculate electric field here, electric field here, electric field here, or electric field here at this point, or electric field at this point. So how to do that? So during the last lecture, we have learned Clomb's law to calculate the electric fields produced by charges. And today, we will have this information. Gauss law is a relationship between the field at all the points on the surface and the total charge enclosed within the surface. As I have given the general formula here at the beginning, okay, we will deal with this formula. So now let me discuss the different situations to better understand the charge and electric flux. What is the charge? What is the electric flux? Here we have two boxes. One is on the left side, this one, and we have another one here on the right side. We have two boxes. And within both boxes, we have positive charge. OK, here you see a single positive charge. And here on the right side, you see two positive charges. And due to positive charge, we have electric flux through the surface of the box. OK, and what about the direction of the electric flux? This is the direction of the electric field due to the positive charge. We have discussed this one during the last lecture. OK, but what about the amount of flux? Here we have one Q, one positive Q, but here on the right side we have two positive Q, two positive charges. So the answer is here. The field patterns on the surfaces of the boxes are different in detail since the box on the left contains one point charge and the box on the right contains two charges. OK, so then we will have different electric flux. Because electric flux is proportional to the charge enclosed within the surface. OK, now let me continue with the negative charge. Again, we are dealing with the charge and electric flux. So here we have on the left side a negative charge and here we have two negative charges in the same box, OK? And then we have inward pointing electric flux on the surface. Since we have negative charge here within the box. OK, then we have a special condition, zero net charge inside a box. Net charge is zero. So what happens if there is zero charge inside the box? If the box is empty, so here you see a box. Here we have a rectangular shape. It doesn't matter. You can have spherical or cylindrical shape, but we have nothing within the box, OK? This box is empty since this box is empty, the electric field is zero everywhere. And there is no electric flux into or out of the box. So there is no charge within the box. For this reason, there is no electrical field. And then we don't have any electric flux. OK, due to the zero net charge inside the box. But sometimes we can have charges within the box. So here we have one positive charge and here we have one negative charge with the same amount. But in total, we have zero charge within the box. And then we have zero electrical field and we have zero net flux. Actually, this point is very important. Due to the positive charge here, we have 
outward flux, outward electric flux due to this positive charge. And here on the right side, we have inward electric flux due to this negative charge. But in total, this positive flux and negative flux cancel each other. OK, hence there is no net electric flux into or out of the box. So you can easily get this information if you know that if the net charge is the zero within the box, then electric field is zero and the net flux is zero. And now let's discuss the third situation. Again, we have nothing within the box. On the right side, you see a box, but the box is empty. There is no charge within the box. OK, but here. Outside of the box, we have a charge sheet. OK, this is, let's say, two dimensional. Uniformly charged sheet, OK, and we have charge here. So due to this positive charge, we have electric field lines like this, OK? And then we will have electric flux. But look at carefully. Just choose this surface, for example. Electric flux enters into this surface and then leaves from this surface. Same amount of flux leaves from the surface. Since the same amount of flux enters and leaves from the surfaces of the box, then the net electric flux through the box is zero. OK, I hope this is clear. So here we have discussed three conditions. In the first condition, we have nothing within the box then charge is zero, electric field is zero, and flux is zero. In the second case, we have charges here, but the net charge again zero, then net flux is zero. And in the final condition, we have nothing within the box. Box is empty, but here we have a charge sheet. So due to this charge sheet, we have flux, but the total net flux again zero because on one end of the box, the flux points into the box. On the opposite end, the flux points out of the box. And on the sides, the field is parallel to the surface. And so the flux is zero. So these are the three conditions for the zero net charge inside a box. Do you have any question here? Now, Let's continue with the different conditions for the flux. So what affects the flux through a box? So how to decrease the flux or how to increase the flux? We have again different conditions. On the left side here, we have a box and within a box we have a positive charge and we have outward electric flux through the surface. OK, outward electric flux through the surface. And here on the right side, we have another box. And within this same box, we have two positive Q charges. OK, and we have electric flux outward. But what about the magnitude of the electric flux? Doubling the enclosed charge also doubles the magnitude of the electric field on the surface. So the electric flux through the surface is twice as great as in this first condition. So if you have here this flux and here on the right side we have this flux because we have doubled the charge. So here we have important statement which summarizes these conditions. The net electric flux is directly proportional to the net amount of charge enclosed within the surface. Here on the left side, we have positive Q charge. And here on the right side, we have positive 2Q charge. Okay. 
So now let's continue. What about the size of the closed surface? Here on the left side, we have positive Q charge. And on the right side, we have the same positive Q charge. And here we have this on the left side, small box. Here we have certain DA area, but on the right side, we have much bigger surface. And what about the electric flux? Don't forget this one. The net electric flux is independent of the size of the closed surface. It only depends on the amount of charge within the closed surface. OK, why? Let me explain in this way. Here we have flux, which is given with E times the A area. And which is given with Q enclosed epsilon zero, right? This is the Gauss law. And here in this condition, so if you write the electric field, it is like this for pi epsilon zero Q over R square. And if you write the area, for example, if you choose certain area here, then you will have another R square, okay? So this electric flux will be independent of the size of the closed surface. So here on the right side, you can see that the magnitude of the electric field on the surface is one over four as great as in A, but the area through which the field flows is four times greater. So look at this area on the right side. Area is, let's say 4A, okay? Here we have area A and here we have 4A, but what about electric field? Here we have electric field E, but here we have E over four. Why? Because the distance from the charge source to the area increases, okay? Compared to this first condition here, then since here we have R square, then we will have this condition for the electric field. And then here we have 4A, here we have E over four, and here we have A and E, then what about the result? For the first condition on the left side, you can write this one like this. And for the second condition on the right side, you can write electric flux again with this one. Okay, it does not change. And it depends on the Q. Q epsilon zero, you will get the same result. I will go into detail with this one, but just keep this information in your mind. So now, how to calculate the electric flux? Actually, you know of this information from your high school years, also from the physics one. First of all, just consider a flat area perpendicular to a uniform electric field this is the flat area A on the right side, flat surface area, okay? But this area must be perpendicular to the electric field lines, okay? So here we have electric field lines from left to the right, okay? And this is the A surface, and this is the surface normal. Then the flux, is given with this equation e times a okay this is the scalar product you can also write this one like this e times a cosine phi phi is the angle between the surface normal and electric field 
this is important. Just listen carefully. Here we have A area, and this is the surface normal. Okay, this is the A vector, so surface normal, and this is the electric field. Okay, this is the direction of the electric field. And what about the angle between this electric field and surface? The angle is zero. Okay, then what about cosine phi? If phi is zero, cosine phi is one. Then here we have result, okay, electric flux. So what happens if you have a stronger electric field? Just consider that here we have a stronger electric field source. Then if you have bigger electric field, then we will have bigger flux. If we have bigger area, then again we have bigger flux, okay? So increasing the area means that more electric field lines pass through the area. This increases the flux. In addition to that, stronger field means more closed space lines and therefore more flux. We have discussed this one during the first lecture. But now let's discuss another condition. What happens if the area is not perpendicular to the field? So now we have this area and this is the surface normal of this area. And this is the electric field direction from left to the right. And this is the phi angle between electric field and surface normal. Okay, then the flux is again written with this formula. But what about the flux? If the area is not perpendicular to the field, fewer field lines pass through it, okay? In this case, the area that counts is the silhouette area that we see when looking in the direction of the field. So you have to get the perpendicular part of this area to the electric field. Then here we have a perpendicular, perpendicular part of this area. Or you can write this expression A cosine phi, okay? Here we have phi angle, here we have A area, and A cosine phi gives us the perpendicular area to the electric field. Then again, we have this flux formula, e A cosine phi. Is it clear? Can you follow the transparencies? Do you have any question? Okay, now let's continue with the another condition. What happens if the area is edge onto the field? Here we have A area. Okay, and this electric field lines moves from left to the right, okay? And then the area is edge onto the field. In this case, the area is perpendicular to the field and flux is zero. So look at this surface normal, okay? This is the electric field direction and this is the surface normal direction. The angle in between phi angle is 90 degrees. Then if you write 90 degrees within this equation, cosine 90 will be zero, then electric flux will be zero. Okay. So just summarize three conditions. In the first case, this is the surface normal electric field lines are parallel to the surface normal and here we have maximum electric flux which is given with e times a and if you have this type of condition this is the surface normal and this is the direction of the electric field lines then the flux is given with e a and cosine phi, the angle between electric field and surface normal. And if you have this last condition, electric field lines are perpendicular to the surface normal, then 
the electric flux is zero because cosine 90 is zero. So we have discussed three conditions. Then, in general, we can get this formula. The flux through a surface must be computed using a surface integral over the area. This equation here. This is the electric flux. This is the surface integral. This is the magnitude of electric field. This is the angle between electric field and normal to the surface. And this is the element of surface area. Or you can write this one E perpendicular or component of electric field perpendicular to the surface. Or you can write this one area perpendicular like this here we have discussed. You see here we have area perpendicular or you can get electric field perpendicular. Then we have electric flux. This is very useful formula for non-uniform electric field. And what about the SI unit for electric flux? During the last lecture, we have discussed that the unit of electric field is Newton per clump, okay? And the unit of area is meter square. Then the unit of electric flux is given with Newton meter square per clump. Okay. Do you have a question until this point? Then let me continue with the example 22.3, electric flux through a sphere. Here we have a point charge on the center of the sphere. This charge is given with positive 3 microcoulomb, is surrounded by an imaginary sphere of radius 0.2 meter. This is the radius of the sphere. Just consider here we have an imaginary sphere, okay? And find the resulting electric flux through the sphere. So how to calculate the electric flux? In order to calculate the electric flux, we need this formula here on the right side. This one, okay? This is the formula. If you know the electric field, and if you know the area, then you can calculate the electric flux. So just put the electric field, just put the area of this spherical shape, which is given with 4 pi r square. And then finally, the electric flux is given with this q over epsilon zero. So q is given in the question, r is given in the question, and epsilon zero is a constant. If you put all numbers here, then you can calculate this electric flux. Actually, you don't need this radius. Okay, be careful. Here we have r square, and here we have another r square, so they cancel each other. You don't need the information about the radius. So, it is stated here in the evaluate part, we would have obtained the same flux with a sphere of radius two meter or 200 meter with the same charge. Okay, here let me discuss, let me introduce a bio application flux through a basking shark's mouth. This is the basking shark. It is different from other sharks Unlike aggressive carnivorous sharks, such as great whites, a basking shark feeds passively on plankton in the water that passes through the shark's gills as it swims. So there is a flux through this area, okay? This is the area of the mouth of the shark, and there is a flux of course, this is not electric flux. This is just analogy to the electric flux, okay? And water enters into the mouth of the shark with some certain velocity, and this water contains many planktons, okay? 
to survive on these tiny organisms requires a huge flux of water through a basking shark's immense mouth, which can be up to a meter across. Okay, so this is the around one meter. Okay, the water flux, the product of shark speed through the water and the area of its mouth can be up to 0.5 meter cubic per second. It means that 500 liters per second. So it is huge number of water, okay? In one second, 500 liters enters into the mouth of the shark. And then this water contains planktons, very tiny organisms, okay? Then basking shark feeds passively. So this is the bio analogy of flux. Then let me continue with the Gauss law. Actually, I have already given you many information about the Gauss law. In the first transparency, I have told you that this lecture will be related to the Gauss law and we will use this relation, this equation to calculate the electric flux and we will use it to find a relation between electric flux and electric field and electric flux and electric charge. So actually what Gauss did, he provided a different way to express the relationship between electric charge and electric field. Remember the Clomb's law. This is the main difference between Clomb's law and Gauss law. In Coulomb's law, electric field is given with this expression, Q over R square. And what about the Gauss law? In Gauss law, the relation between electric field, here we have electric field, and what about the charge? Q enclosed. So then we, here we have a relation between electric field and charge. Here we have a relation between electric field and charge, okay? This also gives us the electric flux. So this is the Gauss law. This is the Clomb's law, okay? So what we have here, we have relation between electric field and charge. Electric field and charge, same. But Gauss law provides a different way to express the relationship between electric charge and electric field. And generally, this is very useful when you are dealing with the complicated shapes and especially for symmetric conditions, this method is very useful. So now let me continue. Do you have any question here until this point? On the right side, we have a positive charge. Here you see in the center of the spheres and here we have positive Q charge. And here I consider a sphere with the radius r and here on this sphere i have area of da okay and then i imagine a concentric second sphere with the radius of 2r this is the second sphere it is concentric what is the meaning of concentric the center of this small sphere and the center of this bigger sphere are same, okay? This is the concentric, H is the in Turkish. And here in the bigger sphere, we have this area for the A, okay? Here we have R radius, here we have two R radius, and here we have the A area, here we have four the A area. And we have electric field lines from positive charge in outward direction, like this, electric field lines everywhere, okay? And I am dealing with the electric field lines passing through these areas. Look at this area. Here I have the A area. Here I have electric field lines, three electric field lines, this ones, and here I have for the A area on bigger surface with two R radius. Here we have four the A. Then again, I have three electric field lines. 
the same number of field lines and the same flux pass through both of these area elements. And just try to calculate the electric flux through this surface due to discharge and just try to calculate electric flux on this bigger surface due to this positive charge. The result will be same. OK, what about the electric field? Electric field produced by this charge is given with this expression. 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q over r square. OK, and what about the area of the sphere? The area of the small sphere is given with 4 pi r square. Then put this area here in the flux formula and then put this electric field here in this flux formula, and then we will find this expression, okay? Then do the same for the bigger sphere. For the bigger sphere, what about the electric field? Electric field is given with 4 pi epsilon zero. What about the charge? Charge is same for the bigger sphere. What about the radius? Radius is 2r, for the bigger sphere. And what about the area? Area for the bigger sphere is 4 pi 2r square. Okay? Then, if you write this electric field in this equation, if you write this area in this equation, then you will have the same result. Okay? So then we have this conclusion with the green color stated here. Hence, the electric flux is the same for both areas and is independent of the radius of the sphere. You see, what about the result on the right side? The result only contains amount of charge and constant number, epsilon zero. Only amount of charge affects the electric flux, okay? for these concentric spheres. Do you have any question here? Then let me continue with the non-spherical surface. Here we have a symmetric perfect spherical surface, but here we have non-spherical surface. Okay, again, here we have positive Q charge, a point charge. So if you have this type of non-spherical surface, you have to use this formula. Just choose a dA area and integrate this one over dA, okay? This is the electric field, this is the area, and the result again will be Q over epsilon zero. And if you know the charge, without calculating electric field, without calculating the area, you can easily calculate the electric flux. And what about a surface with zero net charge? Here we have a surface, non-spherical surface, and there is no charge within this surface. What about the electric flux? Without any calculation, you can use this relation. If there is no charge, then electric flux is zero, okay? If we have a charge here outside a closed surface, as I have explained in the previous transparencies, the flux enters into the surface and the flux leaves from the surface are equal to each other, and the net electric flux is zero again, okay? So if you have a closed surface with zero net charge, then we have zero net flux. So for this reason, here we have this title, Gauss law in a vacuum. What is the meaning of vacuum? In a perfect vacuum, we consider that there is nothing, there is no particle, there is no charge, there is no mass, okay? in perfect vacuum condition, I mean. So if you don't have any particle within this surface, 
if you don't have something, if you have a vacuum within this surface, then it means that there is no charge. Then if there is no charge, the electric flux is zero. Do you have any question here? So then let's summarize the Gauss law here. Let Q enclosed be total charge enclosed by a surface. Let's consider here I have a closed surface and here we have positive Q charge, another positive Q charge here, let's say minus three Q charge or here another minus Q charge, okay? So what about Q enclosed? This capital Q enclosed gives us the total charge within this surface, this closed surface, okay? So then you can get this general formula for the Gauss law. Electric flux through a closed surface. This is the electric field. This is the area, the A area. And this is the total charge enclosed by surface. If the total amount of charges within this closed surface is zero, then Q enclosed is zero, then electric flux is zero. We have already discussed. And here below you see many different forms of Gauss law. We have already discussed many of them. Electric flux can be written in this form, E cosine phi dA or it can be written with E perpendicular dA or E scalar product dA or Q enclosed epsilon zero. Okay, now let's discuss positive and negative flux. We have already discussed the direction of the positive and negative flux. What about the magnitude of positive and negative flux? Here we have a surface and here we have positive Q charge on the left side, and this surface has this radius R, okay? Radius R, spherical surface. On the right side, we have minus Q charge. Magnitude is same, but negative charge. And this spherical surface has also the same radius R, okay? Then I would like to calculate the electric flux through this spherical surface on the left side, and I would like to calculate electric flux through the spherical surface on the right side. Since on the left side I have positive Q charge, then we will have outward flux, positive outward flux, and since on the right side we have negative charge, we will have negative inward flux. Okay, don't forget this one. And if you calculate, you can get this results. Electric flux for this spherical surface. Here, just write the electric field due to this positive charge. And this is the dA area. The A area is given with, with 4 pi r square. Then just put the charge here. The result is Q over epsilon zero. And if you come to this condition, here we have minus Q. Other parameters are same. Area is same. Magnitude of the electric field is same. Radius is same. Okay. Only we have negative sign for the charge. Then we have negative sign here for the electric flux. Negative Q over epsilon zero. If you have negative number here, it means that you have inward electric flux, okay, due to negative sign here. So, with this transparency, I will finish my lecture. This is the conceptual example in the book. The example number is 22.4, electric flux and enclosed charge. So here, look at the example it is very simple very easy if you know this formula you can easily solve this type of examples without doing any calculation it is very useful okay this is the general formula of gauss law so now question what is the electric flux through the 
surface A. Here we have A surface on the right side. Let's say perfect spherical surface, A surface. And what is the total charge within this A surface? The total charge is given with positive Q within this A surface. Then just put this positive Q here into the Q enclosed. Then the result is this one, positive Q over epsilon zero. And what about the electric flux through the B surface? B surface is this one. And what about the total charge within the B surface? The total charge within the B surface is given with minus Q. Then put this minus Q here. Then the result is minus Q over epsilon zero. Now let's discuss the other conditions. What about the electric flux? through the surface C. This is the C surface, this one. What about the Q enclosed for the C surface? Here we have positive Q, and here we have negative Q. In total, Q enclosed is zero for C surface, right? Since Q enclosed is zero, then electric flux through this surface is zero. And here on the right side, we have an additional surface. What about the electric flux through this D surface? Let me show you with the pen. Here we have a D surface, you see. And within this D surface, what about the total charge? Total charge within this surface is zero because there is no charge. But you can say that we have charges outside of this surface. We have positive Q and negative Q charges. But since the electric flux due to these charges cancels each other, okay, just, just, just consider this condition. Here we have this D surface, and here we have just single positive charge. Even under these conditions, electric flux is zero for this D surface because we have electric field lines, outward electric field lines due to this positive charge, and we have this flux into the surface, and we have same flux out of the surface, okay? Then the flux again zero. And here, if you have an additional charge or here, if you have an additional charge, it doesn't matter. You will just look what about the charge within this D surface. Within this D surface, we have zero net charge. Then the electric flux through this surface is zero. I hope it is clear. If you have any question, please let me know. During the next lecture on Thursday, we will continue with the applications of Gauss law, and you will see many examples. In addition to that, we will compare our solutions with the Klomp's law, okay? During the last lecture, we have done some calculations, some, some electric field calculations by using the Clomp slow and during the next lecture we will do some electric field calculations by using the Gauss law. You will see that you will get the same result, but Gauss law will be much simple to calculate the electric fields and electric fluxes. Do you have any question? If not, I finish this lecture. See you on Thursday.